Okay, yeah, so as I told you, uh, I am stuck uh, in uh, isolation, although I probably don't have COVID. Uh, it's it's uh, more prudent as a contact case to do this online. So I'm going to um, finish the, the session on uh, economics and society uh, with uh, well-being and uh, climate economics. And if we have time, uh, we'll start the session on finance. And please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Uh, I'd like the class to be as lively as, as possible, even if it's on Zoom. So the first uh, Nobel Prize uh, we'll talk about today is Amartya Sen, uh, who is one of my favorite Nobel Prize. Uh, his work is at the junction between philosophy and economics. Uh, in a famous book uh, for the general audience, Development as Freedom, uh, Amartya Sen develops uh, his own theory of justice where freedom is the goal and in particular capabilities, which are substantive freedom. So he distinguishes positive freedoms, uh, which is another synonym, and negative freedoms, which are just formal freedom. So a capability or substantive or positive freedom is the availability of ability to do something like uh, ability to eat, uh, ability to, to walk in the streets uh, uh, without uh, being in, uh, in danger, um, ability to, um, to sleep uh, nine hours per day, I don't know. And uh, this is in contrast from um, formal freedom or negative freedom, which is the, the, the formal right to do it. So if uh, you are uh, starving, uh, you are lacking the capability to eat because you don't have enough money to buy food. But no, nothing legally prevents you from buying food and from eating. So you don't um, lack from the formal freedom of eating. And for Amartya Sen, uh, what we should aim for as a society is to increase people's capabilities uh, so increase the freedom uh, that people enjoy, but the substantive freedom that they can really use. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I just gave this example. And so what matters uh, when we think of equality is equality of capabilities, uh, which is uh, finer than just equality of incomes, uh, because you have uh, some things that are not related to income. Uh, for example, if uh, you have like, um, you know, the, the, the right to open a bank account uh, for uh, uh, women, it's, it's, it has been uh, forbidden in many countries uh, and maybe it still is in some countries. Uh, it's not related to, to, the, to your income, but uh, it uh, reduces your freedom. So uh, we should avoid uh, such rules. Um, there is another way in which um, income is a poor proxy, uh, even when uh, it's about uh, resources, is because people have different needs. So someone that is disabled may need uh, a personal assistant to help uh, this person uh, eat or uh, wash themselves, etc. cetera. Uh, so this person needs more income or more resources devoted to her. And uh, this is the reason why we need uh, equality of capabilities and not strictly income. Uh, since capability approach was pivotal in developing um, the Human Development Index, which is developed uh, by the UN. Uh, so this index is a better uh, measure of prosperity than the GDP, and it has three components the GDP per capita, uh, the number of years of schooling, and uh, the life expectancy. So if um, it's, it's a measure between zero and one, if uh, in the country, um, the GDP per capita is higher than $75,000 uh, per year, uh, everyone uh, has at least a master's degree, and the life expectancy is higher than 85, then the HDI is one. And some countries have HDI close to one uh, already. <clears throat> yes, 
Now, um, he takes in this book uh, the example of uh, the Indian state of Kerala uh, to illustrate the difference between uh, GDP per capita and what really matters. Because Kerala uh, had a very um, advanced um, system of uh, healthcare system, uh, education system, which dates back to the 19th century, actually. And um, redistributive policies, public services, and a, a strong political involvement of all society make uh, QLS HDI on par with much richer uh, countries or states, uh, for example, Mexico, as uh, twice the income of Kerala, but the same HDI. So in Kerala, almost everyone is literate, which is not the case in other states of India. The life expectancy of people in Kerala is higher than the life expectancy of African-American in the US. Um, and uh, so basically people are educated, they have healthcare, uh, it's a democratic state, uh, but they, are, are, they have very low income. Uh, they are in, in the Indian average. And, uh, and so this shows that uh, there are a lot that uh, we can do, uh, even without uh, very high income, to increase people's capabilities. Then uh, Amartya Sen uh, highlighted uh, an issue in uh, China, in uh, South Asia, with the exception of Kerala, and in the Middle East, uh, there are much more men than women. So if we compare um, these countries uh, with Africa, in these countries, the ratio of women to men is 95%, but in Africa is 105%. So why do we compare to Africa? Because uh, there could be some explanation why there are less women in, in these countries uh, because of their uh, low or middle incomes. For example, uh, women die, have more chances to die when they give birth. And uh, this may explain the, 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 the lower number of, of women. But this is not the case because in Africa, they, they are um, at least as poor. And uh, so women also die uh, when they give birth. And yet, uh, there are more women than men. No, the explanation is um, the so yeah. The, the explanation is um, that women suffer from um, strong discrimination. I mean, in, in social norms, um, in particular, uh, the 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 child there is more neglect of uh, young girls as compared to young boys. Uh, they are um, not as well nourished and um, cared and, um, and cured when they have a disease as the boys. And, uh, and this translates is higher in higher mortality rates for, for, for girls when they are very young and, uh, and even later in, uh, in their life. Um, this this um, issue can, I mean, the, the missing women can be overcome if uh, women are given more rights. Sen observes that uh, when women have the right to own their own land, when they have the right to inherit, uh, when they have the right to to work by themselves independently, um, then their situation improves. Uh, they gain more bargaining power within the household, and uh, they are more able to defend their, their interest, the interest of the girls, and uh, this is the way to go. So it's not just about resource distribution, because uh, you can distribute money uh, to, to women if um, they are discriminated against, their husband will, uh, will, will take the, the money and, uh, and the, 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 the girl will not be uh, better treated. Amartya Sen also studied the cause of famine. Uh, when he was a, a child uh, in uh, what's now Bangladesh, uh, he experienced a, a famine. So he was from a well-off family, so uh, he was fine, but he saw people uh, 
dying. Uh, there were, I think, three million people who died in this uh, in this famine, and it was a big shock to him. He showed in his research that fam famines are not due to a lack of food. The reason for famines are war, lack of uh, democracy, in particular, lack of uh, accountability and lack of uh, free press because free press is uh, important in um, making the information available, including for the government that there is a famine and um, accountability is important that the government actually cares of what is happening to the people. And a, a third reason for famines is inequality. So actually, uh, in, uh, in a famine in, uh, in Bengal in, uh, in 73, uh, Amartya Sen observed that uh, those who died were the farmers, which may seem weird because farmers, we think they have food, but actually no. And the, the harvest was even not lower than the previous years. It was, uh, the, the reason was that uh, the, the, the war caused maybe it was 43, sorry, not 73. The war caused some panic. Uh, so people uh, bought uh, all the food they, they could when the war uh, started, like uh, toilet paper when COVID started. And uh, the price of food uh, rised and uh, the poorest people couldn't afford food anymore. Um, then he also contributed to uh, social choice theory. Sen is famous for his liberal paradox. He shows the impossibility of being at the same time paration and liberal. What does it mean? Let's take an example. So I am a terrible cook, yet I want a cake. I know that your cakes are excellent, but you are lazy to cook right now. You have better to do. So I prefer that you bake me a cake. Then if you don't want, I prefer to bake it myself. And my least preferred choice is to not eat a cake. And you prefer to not eat a cake. But if we eat something, uh, if there is a cake, you will eat it. And, and you prefer to cook it in this case. So in the liberal case, everyone chooses for oneself. So I'm free to choose whether I bake or not, and you are free to choose whether you bake or not. In this case, I will cook it. But we both prefer that you cook it rather than I cook it. So the liberal uh, outcome is not Pareto optimal, okay? How can we uh, go out of this paradox? So, the paradox uh, more formally says that as soon as there is, um, uh, as there, are, there are two persons uh, that can, even in a society, there are at least two persons that can decide uh, what to do on a specific question, for example, to cook or not to cook, which is uh, the minimum uh, liberal condition then uh, societies uh, have to, to give up on uh, Pareto optimality. The only way out of the paradox, according to Amartya Sen, is to restrict uh, the preferences. So, because in this case, I am uh, better off by making you worse off. I am better off if you cook, although uh, you would prefer not to. So I exert on you uh, an externality, a negative externality. And according to Amartya Sen, uh, the only way out of this paradox to uh, allow for these two desirable uh, conditions that people can decide for themselves and we are in an efficient uh, society, we should restrict uh, our preferences and uh, not have preferences such that uh, I am made better off by making uh, someone else uh, worse off. He says the ultimate guarantee for individual liberty may not rest on rules for social choice, but on developing individual values that respect each other's personal choices. 
if there are questions on this. Um, yeah. Now let's turn to Angus Deaton, uh, another very cool uh, Nobel Prize. Um, so he was, uh, he became famous uh, by his study of um, micro level consumption data. At this time in the, the 60s and 70s, uh, we, we used models of, with a representative agent. And Deaton was uh, very critical that these models could say anything relevant on consumption. And uh, he said we should explore individual data like consumer surveys. It was also the time where uh, these data became more widely available as well as the computing power necessary to use it. So he helped improve the methodology to use individual data and he, he analyzed the results, made some interesting discoveries. So there are a number of complications uh, by using consumer data. First, to compare the level of consumption of different people, you need to adjust for the size of the household. Because if there are two people in a household, they will not consume twice as much. Because perhaps uh, one person needs 30 meters square, and for two persons, 40 meters square is enough. You don't need the double, you don't need 60 meters square. Uh, so you have a lot of economies of scales like that, not only on rent. Um, so this is one thing, adjusting like how to uh, adjust for the size of the household. We will not divide by the number of people in the household, but uh, then how to do it. Uh, then uh, there is also the question of how to compare people living in different periods and in different countries. So in different periods, uh, we use the, uh, for, for both cases, we use the consumer price index, uh, which works the following way. We take a basket of goods that are representative of what people consume. So, uh, for example, uh, I don't know, 500 uh, francs of food, uh, uh, 100 in beverage, uh, uh, 200 in uh, tramway, uh, uh, 1,000 in, uh, in rent, uh, et cetera. So this uh, basket of goods is defined not in, uh, in money terms, but in terms of the good that compose it, right? Uh, that I've just listed. And then we use the same basket of goods across time and space and uh, compute the cost of this basket. And uh, the evolution of the cost uh, is the inflation, is the, our measure of inflation. And the difference in cost uh, of the basket between different countries is uh, the purchasing power parity. And you, to compare the purchasing power of people across time or space, you uh, adjust for inflation or for purchasing power parity. This raises some issues because uh, people do not consume the same basket of goods across time and space. So uh, because uh, good uh, evolved, there is a technological innovation because people of uh, different countries don't consume the same things. Uh, so, Deaton um, helped uh, providing answers to, the, to these issues. Then with the data uh, he helped uh, put in, in shape, uh, he made some interesting uh, findings. For example, half of Indian children are currently undernourished. And uh, this is also the case of half of uh, uh, pregnant women in India, which has consequences on, on their future children. Um, and some puzzling uh, finding is that the calorie consumption is actually decreasing in India in the last years, even if there is GDP growth. Uh, so a possible explanation, but uh, Ditan is not sure uh, that is a good explanation, is that uh, with the progress of agriculture and mechanization, 
people actually need less food, less caloric intake. Um, and, uh, and so this may explain why they are becoming richer and eat less at the same time. But still, uh, the level of calorie consumption in India is, is very low. It's like 2,000 calories per day. Uh, in, in France or Switzerland, it's 3,500. 3, in the US, it's 3,800, probably too much. In, uh, in Japan, they are healthy. It's uh, just below uh, 3,000. In China, it's 3,000. Um, in Burundi, it's, it's uh, 1,700. So you see there are very uh, wide differences in the caloric intakes uh, across countries, uh, showing that uh, yeah, there are some people uh, that struggle to, to eat. And this is probably one of the biggest uh, concerns that we should have. Um, his very famous work was with Mulbauer, where they develop an almost ideal demand system. What is that? So it's a model that uh, explains how consumption choices react to prices and income changes. So with this model, you are able to estimate using available data, what is the price elasticity of gasoline, for example. So if the price of gasoline increases by 10%, uh, how people will respond, uh, by how much will they decrease their gasoline consumption. Same thing if their income increases, how by how much uh, they will increase uh, their consumption of every type of food. So this uh, model has, has uh, ideal properties, it's very flexible. It can accommodate for any kind of behavior, including people that do not maximize. And thus it allows to test uh, whether certain theories uh, hold or not, like utility maximization, the permanent income hypothesis, et cetera. Using uh, individual level data, Deaton found that there is no causality from the GDP to health. There are some countries where uh, GDP stagnates and health improved. This was the case in, in China or in Bolivia in the 60s. And some countries where it's the contrary, the GDP increases, but the health uh, life expectancy stagnates or even decreases. So Deaton finds that uh, health is rather due to um, policies and the implementation of uh, infrastructure like a uh, sewage system, uh, basic uh, yeah, toilets or things like that, as well as information campaign that people should uh, wash their hands, uh, wear a mask during the pandemic, uh, use condoms, etc. Um, it's also uh, due to the implication of uh, the government and uh, for the same level of GDP, you can have different level of involvement. A recent work by uh, Deaton and uh, his wife Case um, had, uh, w w came to a surprise to, to, to many of us. Uh, they found that the life expectancy of low educated white Americans is decreasing. So, Although the, 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 the US um, economy is growing, uh, although uh, there are progress in, uh, in medicine, uh, the life expectancy of uh, the rednecks is decreasing. They uh, call this the death of despair because the reason for the mortality increase is uh, opioid overdoses. Uh, last year, there were 100,000 uh, overdose in the US, death from overdose. So uh, it's, it's really huge. I mean, uh, last year, COVID uh, killed perhaps uh, 500,000 people, but it was mostly uh, older people, right? So 80 year old people. Uh, overdose people, they killed 100,000 people last year and uh, much younger people who, so if you count the, the number of uh, years of life uh, lost. I'm not sure whether it's COVID or the overdoses that, that were the, the biggest um, health um, problem in the US. Uh, not only overdoses, but also suicides, uh, cirrhosis, and other uh, diseases uh, uh, emerging from alcoholism. So these deaths are due to uh, isolation and unemployment as root causes. 
and uh, Deaton and Case uh, give an explanation why the life expectancy of uh, African American is still increasing, uh, even uh, those who are low educated, because African American have um, uh, tighter communities. They go more often to uh, the church, and this helps them uh, being less isolated uh, than uh, white American. This is their, their conjecture. Um, yeah, the, um, and then uh, Didan also studied uh, the evolution and the determinants of life satisfactions and showed that it depends much more on conditions like being employed or being married than on income. If you uh, wonder, being employed or married increases your life satisfaction. <laughs> and um, uh, a surprising example is, is China, where subjective well-being, so when you ask people to grade from zero to 10 uh, how satisfied they are with their life, and you take the average across the country, this is what we call subjective well-being of China, is lower now than 25 years ago despite GDP being five times larger. Uh, I'm not sure why is it so, perhaps because they are more stressed, they, they work more, I don't know, but uh, yeah. So this again shows that uh, GDP is not uh, the, or, or more income, more consumption is not uh, always a good thing. Now, are there questions before I, Talk about climate change. No question. Okay. So first, some background information on climate change. Um, a good uh, approximation that uh, it has been shown to be a good approximation by climate scientists is that temperature is proportional to cumulative emission. So we often think that uh, there is a decay of CO2, that the CO2 you emit today in 100 years from now, only half of it will remain in the atmosphere. It's not really true. Uh, a better uh, view is that it stays in the atmosphere for the foreseeable future. Uh, and if you go in the details, uh, I mean, I could go in the details of, of, the, of, of, the, of that if you want. Um, so it decays, but, uh, but there are still an effect in temperature that doesn't. Uh, anyway, the good uh, thing to have in mind is that uh, any emission that we uh, produce uh, leads to a permanent increase in temperature. And the corollary is that to stop climate change, we need net zero greenhouse gas emission. As soon as some emission remain each year, the cumulative emission, that is the emission from the past, increase, and temperature increases. If we continue on the current trend of emission, we will have, uh, so which is the, the red uh, curve, it's actually the, the worst scenario uh, envisioned by the IPCC, Intergovernment in, inter Panel on Climate Change, is uh, the one we are following. Uh, and along this scenario, uh, warming will be of uh, four degrees uh, higher than in pre-industrial levels in 2100 and uh, eight degree higher in the 23rd century. So hopefully uh, we are going to, to change curve, maybe the, the yellow or the blue curve uh, with the recent uh, commitments or promises of, of, of countries. But for the moment, it's uh, only the European Union that, uh, that, is, uh, that is having a consistent climate policy, a policy, climate policy consistent with the two degree targets. And even the European policy has, has some big issues. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, like uh, what it means, uh, plus four degree or plus eight degree, it would, uh, make us back to the climate of, uh, I mean, uh, plus six degrees, uh, it was like uh, uh, 50 million years ago. Uh, and uh, I mean, the, the history of mankind is, uh, is here. Is, uh, it has been uh, 
always at the, at the current temperature or cooler, never, never um, warmer. What will happen in, the, in this worst, uh, I mean, I don't even want to say worst case scenario because it's just a scenario. It could even be higher if we, if we burn even more fossil fuels. Uh, but in this uh, bad scenario, Groenland and uh, West Antarctic would uh, melt uh, slowly but completely. Here, the good image is uh, an ice. So if you have um, an ice uh, in your cocktail, uh, you can finish your cocktail. The ice is still here because the ice takes some time to melt. The Greenland is the same. The Greenland takes uh, 500 years to melt. And uh, with the, um, the current temperature or perhaps a, a bit higher, what we'll have in a few decades, uh, it will be sufficient to, to melt uh, Greenland. So it's just a question of time that uh, the sea level rises by a few meters. And in this bad scenario where uh, West Antarctic also melts, sea level would rise by 15 meters, by 2,500, uh, which would permanently flood areas where uh, 1 billion people currently live, by 2,300. And of course, the, these areas, uh, in these areas, the growth in population is expected. So even if, I mean, the big issue with, with the warming of the earth is that our current society, our current infrastructures, the locations where we are, are adapted to the current climate. And uh, extreme heat would render large areas of China, of South Asia, and of Middle East uninhabitable in the next centuries, in the 22nd century, if uh, climate change uh, goes unabat unabated. This is because um, when the, what we call the wet bulb temperature exceeds 35 degrees, um, so uh, it's, it's another notion of temperature that takes into account the humidity as well. So it's the temperature that will occur when uh, the humidity is maximal. Uh, you cannot uh, stay outside more than six hours Otherwise, you die. And nowadays, uh, it has never been recorded uh, a wet bulb temperature above 35 degrees, or perhaps once or twice in, in some uh, desert. But in the 22nd century, uh, it will uh, occur in uh, large parts of, uh, of these countries. So perhaps uh, humans could, uh, could, live, uh, uh, could still live there if, if they stay indoors with uh, air conditioning but the, the animals, the, the other mammals, they will die. Um, in the less extreme scenario, which corresponds to the international objective since the 2015 Paris Agreement, um, that is a scenario where warming is limited to plus two degrees Celsius in 2100, sea level will eventually rise by six to nine meters. This is due to uh, the melting of Greenland because Greenland represents seven meters of, uh, of sea, uh, if it smells, uh, which would uh, submerge areas where 20, uh, 250 million people currently live. Again, it will not be during the 21st century, but rather during the 22nd, 23rd, 24th century that, uh, that the civil rise will, uh, will be the, the worst. Infrastructure and land used uh, that are adapted to our current climate would be destroyed or rendered obsolete and would need to adapt. Like coastal cities, you would need to abandon the cities and rebuild the city uh, on a higher location. Uh, even during this century, uh, droughts and water scarcity uh, would uh, become uh, more and more of a problem in China and South Asia, in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean as well. And in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, crop yields would decrease by about 20%. Even, uh, with, uh, even if we adapt to climate change, uh, crop yield and change like the, the, the optimal crop, crop yield would decrease because uh, the plants, they don't like when it's too hot. Uh, this uh, has been shown, I mean, the, 
increase in, uh, in, in temperature has been shown to increase the risk of violent conflict. This will especially be true in Africa, and this will cause a large population displacement. Of course, people will want to uh, flee uh, the, the flooded areas or the areas where uh, agriculture is not possible anymore. Um, so of course, this can, these, these, um, the, these uh, problems would, would may be made wo much worse if uh, countries uh, where people want to migrate close their borders. And um, already today, uh, 170,000 uh, deaths are attributable to climate change every year. This is mostly due to uh, diseases like uh, malaria uh, that are spread when uh, the temperature is higher, mosquitoes like that, and also to malnutrition and diarrhea uh, that are caused by um, like uh, the, the, the bad effect on agriculture of, of climate change. So already today, it has uh, bad consequences. And this is even uh, without counting the death uh, due to air pollution. So these pollutants uh, do not have a warming potential. It's like particulates, etc. But they are emitted by uh, combusting, by, by burning fossil fuels, uh, by cars, etc. So if we stop burning fossil fuels, it will uh, avoid the 6 million uh, deaths from air pollution each year, and it will also uh, fight climate change. And uh, another thing to have in mind concerning the impact of climate change is that the tropical countries are much more vulnerable. Vulnerability here, it's uh, a mixture of how good you can adapt to climate change, which is linked to your income, and uh, how bad the, the climate impact will be. Uh, and uh, these impacts will be worse in places where it's already hot, basically. Other questions? No, okay, so now uh, we'll study. Um, what economists have to say about climate change. So there is just one Nobel Prize that has been awarded uh, for climate economists, economics uh, to William uh, Nordhaus. And um, I will start by um, an interesting proposal by Nordhaus, that of a climate club. He advocates a club of voluntary countries where within the club, there would be a common price on carbon emissions greenhouse gas emissions, which provides an incentive uh, to reduce emissions. And there would be sanctions for people outside the club. So Nordhaus uh, proposes uh, trade sanctions, so tariffs from imports coming from countries outside the club to within the club. We could, see, we could think of other types of sanctions. For example, you could uh, uh, forbid uh, the um, people from outside the club to fly towards country within the club, or at least some people like, uh, I don't know, we, we, can, we can be uh, creative here. The idea is that uh, if you don't have this incentive of uh, countries to join the club in the form of sanction, if they don't join, then uh, you are not able to overcome the free riding problem and uh, many countries will not uh, ad adopt uh, climate policies and just rely on uh, the efforts of the others. Nordhaus um, is, uh, and, and by the way, this uh, climate club idea is, uh, I mean, the IMF uh, is studying it and, and uh, some countries are discussing it, discussing it like the EU, uh, Canada, and uh, the, the, the big, um, I mean, uh, problem uh, in climate negotiations is the US. If you can bring the US uh, to accept uh, such a club, then uh, it can probably work because the EU would say yes, China uh, can probably say yes as well. And uh, when you have these three big uh, uh, economies, then uh, you can um, 
convince the whole world. But uh, the US uh, Senate uh, is, uh, is, not, uh, is, is reluctant to, to implement uh, climate policies. Nordhaus is famous because uh, it was one of the first to develop uh, an integrated assessment model, which is a model that integrates the economy and climate dynamics and optimizes the emission trajectory. So uh, his model is called DICE for Dynamic Integrated Climate Economy. Uh, and it's a very crude uh, model. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know in, any uh, environmental economists that do not uh, criticize it. Uh, yet it is the benchmark uh, integrated assessment model. It was the first, this is the, the simpler one. And um, something that uh, all IAMs rely on uh, are the, the four following things. First one is ethical, ethical choices. This is done through the social, social welfare function. So this is the objective of the decision maker. Uh, for example, you can think of uh, the objective as utilitarian, like summing the utilities of each person on earth. And then you also have to specify what utility function you decide. In this case, you would have an equal weight to every human. This is, however, not uh, how it is done in, in uh, certain high AMs like DICE, where more weight is given to rich regions and uh, more weight is given to current generations. It can seem uh, quite uh, unfair, and it is, to give more weight to a rich region than to poor region. The reason for that uh, is that the idea is to, to try to uh, separate uh, optimizing the climate trajectory and the distribution of income, because if you have a fair uh, social welfare function with an equal weight on each human, uh, what you will find is that the optimal policy is to redistribute income from rich countries to poor countries. And uh, these modelers like Nordhaus find this um, unrealistic and they, they want to uh, avoid this uh, outcome from the model. So they, they, put the, they, they define the weight uh, in such a way that there is no transfers between countries. And uh, we look just at uh, the, the, in, the inequalities between generations and, uh, and, uh, and optimize just the, the emissions, the total emissions. This ethical choice also involved uh, inequality aversion and risk aversion parameters. These are the parameters of the utility function. Then, uh, an important component is dynamics equation, like how climate responds to air em greenhouse gas emission. So these are uh, models taken from climate science. Uh, what can we expect uh, for future technological progress, demography, uh, how people uh, choose their level of savings? These are the assumptions that drive the dynamics. Then a crucial one is the damage function. And this expresses by how much society is being worse off by more climate change. And in general, it's very simple. It's just a function of the decrease in GDP that uh, is induced by an increase in temperature. And the last uh, component is a marginal abatement cost curve which gives the cost of uh, reducing emissions, uh, the cost of uh, the marginal emission reduction. So the marginal reduction and uh, emission reduction right now, it would be uh, to turn off coal power plants and to replace them by uh, wind panels, for example, wind, because uh, this can be done with uh, quite cheaply. Then once we've done that, uh, the, 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 the next, the cheaper uh, emission reduction uh, will probably be to switch from uh, gasoline cars to electric cars. Uh, this can be done, uh, that can be made profitable at a, 
somewhat higher uh, carbon price. So if the carbon price is say uh, $200 per ton of CO2, then the price of gasoline increases to the point that electric cars become cheaper than uh, combustion engine cars. And you need to increase the carbon price even further, let's say $500 per ton, to make it profitable to switch the production of steel, for example, from coal to hydrogen. And, uh, and so the, the higher the carbon price, the, the larger the emission reduction, because the larger uh, the, the, the technologies that will be made profitable uh, and that are decarbonized. Taking all these components, uh, the DICE model maximizes the interpol consumption of a representative agent and uh, uses uh, total utilitarian criterion. So it's the sum of uh, the population at time t times the utility of the representative agent at time t and uh, integrated over all generations where uh, later generation utility are discounted at a rate rho. Uh, so we care less about future generation than about ourselves, basically. Then uh, utility, I mean, consumption uh, is given by the level of production minus uh, the ab abatement, uh, which is the um, resources that we devote to reduce emissions, and also uh, multiplied by the damage function, uh, which is decreasing in temperature and temperature square. And uh, it's not shown here, but then there are equations that relate temperature on uh, cumulative emission, and emission themselves depend on production Y and abatement. What uh, the model does then is to estimate the social cost of carbon, which is the discounted sum of expected damages caused by a marginal emission at the optimum. So it's by how much uh, damages from climate change, uh, which are given is the function of T, which is here, by how much these damages increase when we increase emission and uh, damages at time T, and uh, this is done for every time T, uh, starting now until the future, until the, uh, the horizon, where uh, future damages are discounted at the rate R. And the idea is that if we put a carbon price at the level of the social cost of carbon, then the externality is corrected and the economy is put on the optimal trajectory because the social cost of carbon uh, is, is the, the damage that you do when you emit. So if you have to pay this amount when you emit, uh, the cost um, equals the, um, the, the benefit, what you put in the, um, to solve the issue. Uh, and it, it means that you will um, emit uh, only to the extent that uh, your personal, uh, your private uh, utility is worth, is worth more than the externality. And uh, it avoids all emissions that are not uh, socially worth. A crucial parameter on the social cost of carbon is uh, the discount rate, the social discount rate R. It's by how much we, uh, don't care about future generations' welfare. I will talk about uh, two Leontief Prize, Nicholas Stern and uh, Martin Weitzman, uh, who also work on uh, climate economics. Nicholas Stern hmm. is famous for his uh, report for the UK government in 2006 which is a very comprehensive uh, report on climate change, uh, uh, its consequences, um, what we should do about it, and the, the, the social cost of carbon. And the Stern report 
triggered a controversy around the discount rate because Stern doesn't use the same discount rate as Nordhaus. So there was a big debate between the two. Uh, first, uh, we need to explain the Ramsey rule, which was derived by uh, uh, Ramsey in uh, 1928, which is the, the most basic uh, formula for the discount rate, which says that we discount future generation at a rate that depends on, the, that is the sum of the pure rate of time preferences, uh, the row that is here. So this is the pure discounting, um, how much we, we purely uh, don't care about future generation, plus uh, this term eta times g, where eta is the inequality aversion parameter of the utility function, and g is the productivity growth rate. Um, what this formula says is that we uh, care less about future generation, uh, first for intrinsic reason, and second, if these uh, future generation are richer than us. If the growth rate is higher, then it means that their marginal utility will be lower. They will, be, they will need less money than us. So we should care less because, uh, because we, we care less about rich people than poor. And in this case, future generation are richer than current generation. This uh, effect is, uh, the, is, is made, uh, is compounded with uh, our aversion for inequality. So the more we care for inequality, the, the less we care for future generation because they are richer. Discounting has a major effect. I will quote a paper from uh, Chichiniski. She says that at a standard 5% discount rate, which is the value used by Nordhaus, the present value of the earth aggregate output discounted 200 years from now is a few hundred thousand dollars. If one tried to decide how much it is worth investing in preventing the destruction of the earth 200 years from now on, on the basis of measuring the value of foregone outputs, so like uh, climate uh, models do, the answer would be no more than one is willing to invest in an apartment. This is just the effect of the exponential with a 5% rate. It means that what happens 200 years from now, you really don't care at all, even though we've seen that this is where the, the worst impact will be due to sea level rise, etc. So now let me illustrate the different uh, parameters used by Nordhaus and Stern in a simplified way, uh, because they do some bit th things a bit more complicated, but the bottom line is that Nordhaus uses a 5% or 5.5% discount rate and Stern 1.4% discount rate. This leads to different co social costs of carbon, $10 per ton of CO2 for Nordhaus and $100 per ton of CO2 for Stern. Of course, there are much lower emission reduction for Nordhaus, 14% in the short run, than for Stern, 53% in the short term. And the consequence is a higher uh, optimal temperature um, for Nordhaus than for Stern, plus 3.5 degrees in 2100 for Nordhaus and plus 2 degrees uh, for Stern. Why do they have different discount rate? The first thing is the pure rate of time preferences. There, Stern adopts an ethical point of view that the pure rate of time preference should be zero we should not be biased towards current generation uh, on uh, intrinsic motives. Uh, and this is due to moral uh, considerations. So actually it doesn't take zero, it takes 0 0.1. Uh, I don't know why uh, some authors take zero or something. Another way to, to, to do it, what, what could take uh, 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, which would be the exogenous uh, probability that uh, humanity is destroyed, say by a meteorite. This is a valid way why we should not care uh, about people uh, 10 million years from now, because most probably they will not exist. Uh, so it's not really that we don't care about them, that, but that we, we take into account that they, they may not exist. Nordhaus takes 1.5%. Uh, 
which cannot be justified on, on moral grounds. Then Nordas consider that the growth of productivity will be higher than uh, what Stern thinks. And, uh, and the compound effect is also higher uh, uh, for not has. Now, uh, this controversy was uh, 10 years ago, ago. Yeah, and yeah, the reason, the justification of Nord House. So Nord House actually doesn't calibrate the, the discount rate uh, using the, the three components, rho, eta, and j. It just uh, calibrates uh, the R directly by um, equating it with market interest rate. And his reasoning is that uh, the interest rate that we observe uh, on the market is a measure of uh, the discount rate of people, how people uh, discount the future. And because we are uh, modeling uh, what people do, uh, we should take this number as our discount rate. So if we observe in the market that people don't care about the future, why uh, would a decision maker care about the future? Uh, this is somehow, uh, from my point of view, a, a flawed justification because uh, when the decision maker thinks about future generation, this is a social discount rate and it should be distinguished from the individual discount rates that correspond to the decision we make for our savings uh, within our lifetime. So for me and for many other researchers, we should distinguish um, the decision that are made uh, on, uh, on individual decisions and for collective choices. Um, this controversy is much less of an issue these days that market interest rates are low. Uh, so that uh, if we calibrate market interest rate to, uh, if we use market interest rate to calibrate the, the social discount rate, we would find something close to not house. Uh, some uh, economists have made a survey among uh, all experts of discounting and climate economists. And it seems that there is a consensus as 77% of the experts find uh, a discount rate of 2% acceptable. Okay, so more closer to, to Stern than our house. Yet, there is an argument that is uh, too often overlooked, I think. It's one made by Mark Flaubert and Stefan Zuber, who explained that climate policies deserve a negative discount rate. And the reason is the following. The representative agent that is used in, in a climate model is a, a problematic way to deal with the climate because those who are responsible for carbon emissions are today's rich people like us who are able to fly. Uh, uh, I remember that it's, I think it's like 1% of all humans that are uh, responsible for the majority of uh, of emissions due to flying uh, in a given year. And, uh, and it's the top 10% of, of, of humans uh, that emit uh, the, the large majority of, uh, of carbon emissions or around 50%, I don't know, plus, plus minus 10%. Um, so, and the victims of uh, climate change are in the future and uh, in low-income countries. And uh, they, they show that when you look at the economic theory uh, in detail, this uh, G in the formula, it should be the, the growth rate uh, between, it, it's not really a growth rate, it should, it should be the, the difference in, in consumption level between uh, the victims and the responsible. And in this case, it's negative because uh, low-income people in, uh, in 100 years from now they will probably be poorer than uh, us in Switzerland right now. Um, and in this case, uh, this will uh, render uh, R negative. And uh, this uh, objection uh, is part of, of a broader uh, objection uh, to uh, climate modeling in the way uh, climate modelers uh, take inequalities into account. 
climate modelers often take into account internet intergenerational uh, inequalities and uh, this is why they want to fight climate change is to avoid uh, future generation being made worse off by current generation but they forget about um, intra-generational inequalities and it's odd to tackle one inequality without addressing others and if we are consistent and fair then uh, if we optimize social welfare uh, we should fight climate change but also current inequalities this would involve large transfers from the rich to the poor including between countries not only within countries and um, there is another economist, Martin Weitzman, uh, that provides arguments that uh, we should fight uh, climate change in a much more stringent way than what uh, Nordhaus proposes. Uh, because I recall that for Nordhaus, the optimal uh, temperature in 2100 is 3.5 degrees. It's, uh, it's really an outlier among climate economists. Most economists would agree with Norderhaus, uh, with Stern or Weizmann, that um, that that uh, we should uh, that the optimal temperature is is lower. Just by the way, uh, precision. Why um, why there is a trade off? Why we don't say okay, we should uh, the optimal temperature should be plus zero? It's because uh, decarbonization is costly. It's costly to um, change our habits to uh, change our infrastructure, etc. So there is a trade-off between uh, this cost of doing the transition and changing our, our way of living and the cost of climate change. Now, the problem that uh, Weizmann highlighted is that climate science is ripe with uncertainties. Um, this graph shows the distribution of climate sensitivity. So the climate sensitivity is by how uh, many degrees the earth will warm uh, after a doubling in the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. There is, uh, we, we, we don't know for sure. I mean, uh, the last IPCC report, they say it's between 2.5 uh, to four degrees with a best estimate at three degrees. But you see what the different uh, climate models uh, uh, show uh, is highly uncertain. There are other uh, uncertainties like uh, uh, on the on tipping points, uh, like uh, the, the permafrost that can thaw and create a positive feedback loop, uh, the Amazon rainforest that can uh, die back and, and be transformed in a savanna, uh, there are some like the West Antarctic ice sheet that uh, can melt uh, sooner and, and more rapidly than expected. There is different tipping points that we are unsure um, at what temperature they will materialize or if they will materialize. There is also uncertainty on the damages from climate change. Yet major integrated assessment models do not properly model uncertainties. They make as if we knew the probabilities. And Weizmann argued that accounting, or even they, they don't make as if we know the probabilities, they, they often make the assumption that we know what, what are the damages, we know what is the climate sensitivity. They don't even take distributions, but just one point estimate. And Weizmann argued that accounting for uncertainties leads to an infinite social cost of carbon. Just uh, a point on, on this discounting. If you have uh, air negative or zero, then uh, the social cost of carbon will be infinite. Uh, and this means, you can see it by, by the formula, and uh, this means that uh, we should do whatever uh, possible to stop climate change the fastest possible, basically. Uh, so how is that that the social cost of carbon can be infinite even with positive discounting? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a mathematical um, uh, result that if a random variable x, uh, think of climate sensitivity, for example, 
is uh, not known with certainty, then the, the good approximation for its distribution is a distribution that has a fat tail, meaning that uh, it approaches zero more slowly than exponentially. So here, it would decrease towards zero like uh, slowly instead of rapidly. Um, so typically, the, 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 the cumulative density function or the y minus this uh, is a power uh, function, a power law. Uh, this is uh, the, the benchmark case for fat tails. And uh, for certain values of, of alpha, uh, so, the, so the, the lower the alpha, the, the least number of moments that are defined. And for alpha lower than three, even the variance of X is not defined uh, the, the, or random variable because um, it would be infinite. And then uh, Weizmann uh, derived this dismal theorem that when the distribution of some relevant parameters like the climate sensitivity has a fat tail, which holds in case of uncertainties, then society has an infinitely large expected loss from highest consequences, low probability event. So the idea is because we, we are uncertain about the future, we should put a lot of weight uh, on the possibility of catastrophic events. And this is what should drive uh, our decisions. Uh, Weizmann uh, was a very famous climate economist. And uh, for example, he showed in a paper in 4074, under which circumstances we should prefer a carbon tax or a system of tradable quotas to reduce emissions. Bottom line is that uh, quotas are better when uh, the uncertainty lies more on the pollution damages and the damages from pollution. Mm. And the tax is preferable when we have more uncertainty about the cost. Because when we have more uncertainty about the damages, um, well, we want to uh, uh, reduce the, this uncertainty, but by putting a quota where we are sure not to, to exceed a certain level of emission, where the uncertainty is, is more on the, the cost of reducing emissions, then uh, it's better to have a tax so that we are sure of how much we are going to pay, uh, whether while if we had a quota, then maybe the carbon price that will issue uh, from the, the trading of quotas will be too high uh, for the abatement cost that uh, we are willing to, to pay. In practice, this uh, question between tax and quota is, uh, is secondary because if you can revise each year the level of the tax or the level of the quota, the two policies become equivalent. Weizmann advocated for a World Climate Assembly that would vote on the global price of carbon using the one person, one vote majority rule. So we would elect um, proportionally representatives uh, in this uh, World Climate Assembly with one person, one vote for the whole earth. And then uh, the deputies there, they would, uh, each one would propose a carbon price and the medium one would be the global carbon price. Weizmann uh, committed suicide less than one year after the Nobel Prize was awarded to William Nordhaus. Um, and uh, I don't know, it, it may be related. Uh, maybe he was disappointed not to have uh, obtained the Nobel Prize and that the Nobel Prize went to someone that advocated uh, for not so stringent climate policies. And uh, yeah, it's quite sad because most climate economists uh, that I know think that Weizmann would have deserved the Nobel Prize as well, along Nordhaus. Uh, so I've, I'm done with climate uh, economics. Are there some questions? Oh, I have, that's okay. there's some question in the chat. So uh, how to change personal values? Oh, sorry, I didn't see the chat before. So I guess this was about Amartya Sen. Yeah, I mean, 
I'm not sure we can change personal values. So maybe there is no way out of the paradox. Um, I have the same feeling. I don't know what you refer to. Please intervene if uh, uh, you can ex explain yourself. And what is the damage function? Do they assume a certain loss in GDP if business as usual? Um, yes. Uh, I think the the I think the, the it's a good question. I think the 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 the, the benchmark is a benchmark is a business as usual scenario, and uh, you have uh, what happens uh, in the in the business as usual scenario if there is no um, climate change, well zero loss of GDP. If there is one degree uh, more, if there is one degree warming then perhaps GDP decreases by uh, 2%. If there is two degree warming, it decreases by 5%, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, um, and so it's not taking into account the abatement cost. It's only the damages uh, from uh, the climate impacts, like uh, heat waves, drought, sea level rise, et cetera, that are converted into money terms. It's very hard to estimate this uh, damage function. They are, uh, I mean, we, we start to have a much better estimate in the last five years uh, with a tremendous work, uh, especially from uh, people from the Climate Impact Lab in uh, Chicago and Berkeley. Um, and uh, before that, it was like a kind of hat of the hat estimation. And, uh, and one big reason actually uh, why not House uh, finds such a, a high uh, optimal temperature is because his damage function is uh, is very optimistic. And uh, even with his discounting, if we put uh, damage function in line with the recent finding uh, into the, the not House model, we would find uh, something like um, optimal trajectory is plus two degrees. Um, any question? Wondering if nobody speaks. So I think we can make a five minute pause and don't hesitate if uh, you have questions to ask during the pause. Okay, so let's start uh, this session on finance. By the way, uh, next week uh, we'll have a pop quiz um, and it will cover all the session until finance. It will not cover finance. Although, and it will not cover macro as well. It will be all the sessions on, on micro. So, <clears throat> Ari Markovitz is the founder of modern portfolio theory. Markovitz's uh, model of portfolio selection maximizes in one period the returns of a portfolio given the variance of the portfolio. So if you take the variance or a standard deviation it's equivalent that you are willing to uh, accept, and you consider all possible uh, assets, the dots here are the possible assets, or actually the possible portfolios, possible combination of assets. And you will take the portfolio that gives the higher expected return given the standard deviation. The, the, the variance, the standard deviation is a measure of risk. So if you accept more risk, you will earn more higher return on expectation. And this black curve represents the efficient frontier. So a portfolio, if you have only uh, risky assets available, your portfolio will lie somewhere on this efficient frontier. The problem can be uh, formulated mathematically as maximizing the expectation of the return of the portfolio minus the variance of the portfolio where there is a weight Q uh, put on the, on the return, which is the risk tolerance. 
So the higher Q, the higher utility rates risk and the higher the return uh, matters for you, the, the, the lesser the risk matter. A portfolio uh, P is constituted of uh, a way, um, of different assets I with a weight WI for the asset I, all weights sum to one. And uh, we can rewrite uh, this expectation, the portfolio as the sum, I mean, the return of the portfolio as the sum of WI RI. And then we can compute the variance of the portfolio as the, the, the variance uh, of uh, each asset plus the covariance of each pair of assets. This is the sum of uh, WI, WJ, uh, covariance of IAJ. Now, what's interesting is if a, a risk-free asset is available. Usually, we think of uh, government bonds, short-term government US treasury bonds as a risk-free asset. Uh, the rate expected return is the rate of interest of this bond. Then uh, Markowitz theory shows that people will hold only two things, the risk-free assets and this market portfolio, which is um, a portfolio constituted of all assets possible with very precise proportions. It's not here, it's not here. The reason why is that you can do better than the efficiency frontier when you have a risk-free asset available. You can do uh, every point on the red curve, which is called the capital market line. So if the, the standard deviation you, you are willing to accept is this one, your optimal portfolio is here. We call it the market portfolio. But if you want less risk, then you can obtain uh, this expected return higher than what you would have uh, only considering risky assets by uh, holding a mixture of the risk-free asset and the market portfolio. If you are here, you hold only a risk-free asset. If you're here, only in the market portfolio. And if you're here, if you uh, are willing to take more risk than the market, what you can do is borrow at the risk-free rate so that you increase the amount of money that you can invest and you have a weight higher than one for the market portfolio and lower than zero for the risk-free rate. Uh, weights lower than zero in finance, they call this a short position. And it means that you borrow uh, the asset instead of, of holding it. Um, this, what I just explained, is called the two mutual fund, uh, no, sorry. No, it's called the one mutual fund theorem, this one. Uh, and uh, there is also a two mutual funds theorem that says that any point on the efficient frontier can be uh, obtained by any uh, arbitrary pair of portfolio also on the efficiency frontier. So to, to get the market portfolio, uh, you can uh, hold uh, the port like, uh, some, some um, shares in one mutual fund that has this portfolio here and another mutual fund that is uh, um, their portfolio here, it will provide you the market portfolio. There are a number of issues with this uh, problem. The first is uh, to, that to, to uh, compute the market portfolio. The, we need estimates of the variance covariance metrics which is estimated using uh, past returns and covariances. And this estimation makes the portfolio very sensitive to small change in the data. So if you have one additional year of data, the variance covariance matrix changes and the portfolio market portfolio changes by a lot. Also, it requires a very large number of information, all the covariances, because, I mean, you have thousands of different assets. So it makes a matrix of thousands uh, per thousands, uh, which makes uh, the computation uh, very like intractable. 
Then uh, there is underlying this model, a normality assumption for the returns, which turns out to be wrong. Normality assumption it means that the return follow um, uh, uh, the, the normal distribution uh, with the, the mean is the expected return and uh, the variance uh, is given by the, the parameter of the normal distribution. It means in particular that uh, you have the same, you have 50% chance to have a return higher than expected, 50% chance to have a return lower than expected, uh, which is a strong assumption. Also, uh, this is not utility maximization. Uh, you're not maximizing the expectation of a utility function. You're maximizing uh, the expectation of return minus the variance. Uh, this departs from utility, utility maximization. Uh, this way of measuring risk with the variance instead of the utility function uh, yeah, is not uh, consistent with the economic theory. And it ignores loss aversion. It ignores the fact uh, that we have seen with the Kahneman uh, that uh, people care more about not losing than about winning. It is not taken into account. So what we call postmodern portfolio theory addresses the last two problems of uh, the, the normality assumption and uh, measuring risk uh, with UTD maximization, including loss aversion. Uh, no, sorry, it doesn't address number eighty assumption. It addresses the the last two problem be, being uh, the utility function. Uh, they do so using coherent risk measure like the value at risk. So you have um, uh, yeah more recent model, models that are used right now to guide your portfolio choice. A big. Another big name in this uh, field is William Sharp, who developed the capital asset pricing model. So the, um, from Markowitz theory, we know that uh, everyone will hold the risky assets in the same proportion, the proportion of the market portfolio which turn out actually to be the proportion of, uh, of the market itself. And so uh, WI will just be the, the market capitalization of asset I over the total market capitalization of all assets. And um, now, if we think that everyone uses uh, this theory to uh, choose their portfolio. This enters and has implication on the supply and demand of assets. And uh, this influences the price of assets. And what the capital asset pricing model does is um, computing the, the equilibrium price that emerges from this uh, modern portfolio theory. The say APM capital asset pricing model uh, equation is the following one. The expected return of a new, yeah, this model is used to price new assets, okay? Because it gives the equilibrium price of all assets. If you introduce a new asset, so uh, you make an um, initial uh, share uh, offering, uh, you, uh, you, you create a company or you, uh, raise the capital in a company. Um, in investors, uh, in finance, like uh, financial uh, bankers, uh, they use this uh, basic assumption, at least as a starting point, to compute the expected return of uh, the new asset. And the expected return is linked to the asset price, inversely linked. I mean, yeah, the, the link is perhaps more complicated, but it's linked. Um, and um, this is the capital asset pricing uh, equation. It said that the expected return of the new asset A is equal to the risk-free rate interest rate plus the excess return 
uh, of the market relative to uh, the risk free rate times the asset beta. What's the beta? We'll see this in a minute. Uh, I will show you how to derive this equation and the, the beta will appear naturally. So let's assume that uh, this new asset enters the market portfolio uh, with a negligible weight, which is, uh, which is the case because I, I told you the weight is the, the share of the market capitalization of this asset. So we, you will not introduce a new asset that will uh, have a market capitalization equal to like half uh, the, the market uh, capitalization of all other assets aggregated. So the assumption is valid. We can take, um, we can reason at the first order, the linear approximation. Um, then uh, the assets will add return uh, uh, the, this return to them to the to your portfolio. So the expected return of the asset weighted by uh, its its um, market its a share in the portfolio, and it would add the following risk to the market portfolio. Two times uh, the weight on this asset times the covariance of this asset to the market. So the risk that it adds also includes uh, a term that is uh, WA square times the variance of A, but because it's WA square, it will be uh, much lower than this. And so the variance of the asset itself matters much less than how the asset return covers with uh, the market's return. So uh, here there is also the one minus WA in the, form in the formula, but it's uh, approximated to one. So if the asset is correctly priced, according to the model, the improvement in its return to variance ratio achieved by adding it to the market portfolio matches the gain of an increased stake in the market portfolio. If the asset is correctly priced, you are indifferent between buying little more of this asset A or buying little more of the portfolio uh, M. And uh, this uh, translates in this equation. The expected, the excess return on uh, this asset divided by this risk uh, should be equal to the excess return of the market as a whole um, divided by the risk of the market as a whole. We, we don't take the expected return, but the excess return compared to the risk-free rate, because we assume that the investors uh, purchase the assets uh, by borrowing from at the risk-free rate. And uh, if you simplify by 2WA here and here, and uh, you rearrange, you find the CAPM equation, where beta is the covariance of the asset with the market divided by the variance of the market itself. So uh, in a nutshell, beta tells you how the return of the new asset varies, co-varies with the return of the market as a whole. So if they vary in the same direction, then buying this new asset just increases the risk uh, that uh, of your portfolio. So uh, you, you demand a higher return uh, for that. It's perfectly, perfectly aligned, beta equals one. Uh, you, you ask for the market return. If it, uh, it, uh, it varies uh, in the same direction as the market, but with more variation than the market, beta above one, then you will ask, um, a return higher than the return of the market. If on the contrary, 
um, beta is below zero, uh, it means that the returns on the asset var varies in the opposite direction to the market. Think, for example, of uh, shares in a pharmaceutical company. When there is a pandemic, the market does very badly. The, the, the asset prices fall. But pharmaceutical companies uh, do well, so their uh, stock value rises. So in this case, the market and uh, the, the pharmaceutical uh, stock price vary in opposite direction, and we have beta negative uh, because somehow the share in the pharmaceutical company acts as a form of insurance against variation uh, of the market itself. Uh, so you are willing to, to buy these shares even if they have a lower expected return than the market itself. Now, how can we estimate uh, beta? We can estimate it directly using the variance covariance matrix. And you, we can also estimate it using the security characteristic line, which is this equation. This equation relates uh, the excess return of the asset A to the excess return of the market. You compute this value at each time period and you uh, regress one against the other. If the CAPM uh, model is accurate, then uh, you should find alpha equals zero. The intercept should be uh, non-significantly different from zero. And you will estimate uh, the beta. Uh, alpha is uh, the abnormal return uh, of asset A. Abnormal because as I said, if the model is right, it should be zero. Now, the market portfolio consists of all assets in all markets, including art uh, market, the real estate market, uh, Bitcoin, uh, name it, weighted by their market capitalization. It's, as I said, because everyone uh, uses the same uh, model, uh, the share of everyone should be the same, uh, and uh, this should be the market capitalization. Well, this is if everyone uses the Markowitz model, but uh, there are good reasons not to do so because uh, in this capital asset pricing model, we have the same unrealistic assumption than in the Markowitz model. And we also have the assumption of perfect information, which of course are unrealistic. And actually, uh, Fama in French, Fama is another Nobel Prize, uh, showed that uh, this model fails empirical test and uh, most of its applications are not valid. So most sophisticated models of asset pricing exist, but uh, the CAPM is still widely used because it's so simple and easy to understand. Sharp is also uh, famous for a related concept, the reward to variability ratio or Sharp ratio. This reward to vari uh, variability ratio is the thing that appears here, if you notice, is um, the excess return of the asset in expectation divided by uh, the standard deviation of, uh, of the asset. Okay, it's not exactly the same thing because here it's a, it's a covariance, so it's not uh, the, um, the standard deviation of the asset, it's the covariance with the market, sorry. Um, and so this sharp ratio, tells you how um, well does the, the, the asset, um, it's, it's, it allows to compare the returns of assets that have different variabilities and forgetting about uh, how they co-vary with the market. So it's very crude measure of the performance of an asset. So you can compute the, this sharp ratio for different assets. For example, um, between in the, the last uh, 40 years, the stock market's sharp ratio was uh, 0 0.39 and uh, Berkshire had to weigh uh, sharp ratio 
was 0.76 is the highest uh, sharp ratio of uh, um, the Dow Jones uh, index. Berkshire Hathaway is the company funded by Warren Buffett, one of the richest guys in, in the world. Uh, and and uh, they made a clever investment, uh, which explained how they could add, how to perform the market. So Sharp at the same time elaborated a theory saying that everyone should hold the same uh, uh, portfolio and uh, no one could beat the market. And at the same time uh, proposed a measure of how an asset can actually uh, beat the market. Uh, with the sharp ratio. Uh, he also pioneered what is called returns-based style analysis, uh, where here the idea is to regress uh, the returns of a portfolio, portfolio of a given fund, on different market indices. So for example, uh, the US stock market, the Japanese stock market, the, 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 the shares of, of uh, companies that are uh, uh, of small market capitalization, the companies with high market capitalization, the companies uh, in the tech sector, the companies uh, that uh, 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 pay a lot of dividend, etc. And then you regress um, the funds uh, performance on these different markets and it tells you what is the style of the fund. For example, if the fund invests only in American action, then there will be a, a high coefficient on uh, the market indices for US action and a zero coefficient for Japanese actions. Uh, when I say actions, it's stocks. Okay, it's, uh, it's four, so we'll stop here for finance. Uh, next time we'll talk about uh, option pricing and, uh, and more interesting things uh, in finance like uh, the controversy between uh, Fama and Schiller on whether markets are efficient.